We begin a new chapter in our Mark series, heading to chapter 7. So go ahead, grab your Bibles, turn to Mark's Gospel and chapter 7. For the last three chapters, we've been looking at the interactions uh, between Jesus and the crowd and Jesus and his disciples. But as we head into chapter 7, we're returning to the group of religious leaders that Jesus had interaction with just a few chapters ago. And they come in the form of the Pharisees and the scribes. The interaction between Jesus and these religious leaders then gives way today to another teaching moment for the disciples and ultimately a teaching moment for us today. There's two key aspects that I want us to see today as we go into Mark chapter 7. Firstly, our hearts are desperately wicked and without Jesus they are going to remain desperately wicked. Second, our actions betray our heart. In other words, how we behave and what we say reveals the state of our heart. It was Oswald Chambers who eloquently wrote, The man or woman who does not know God demands an infinite satisfaction from other human beings which they cannot give. And in the case of the man, he becomes tyrannical and cruel. It springs from this one thing, the human heart must have satisfaction. But there is only one being who can satisfy the last abyss of the human heart, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to be looking at the heart of the problem, which is ultimately the problem with the heart. And how our heart, if it's for Jesus, is a wonderful and beautiful thing. But if our heart is for self, it can become an abyss and it can become a a conduit of our sin. And so we begin chapter 7 in our Mark series heading to verse 1. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is seen as the capital city of Israel. It is a walled city and it's known as another name called Zion. And that's because Mount Zion, a hill or a peak, is the highest hill and highest peak of the city. And as you can see on the map, it is surrounded by well-known places in the ministry of Jesus. The Garden of Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives and Bethany, just to name a few. Jerusalem is different from any other city. It is, yes, central in terms of being a capital city, but is also central to the people of God throughout the Old Testament. The temple was built in Jerusalem. Sacrifices were given in Jerusalem. And the Ark of the Covenant, that very presence of God, was in Jerusalem. Jerusalem proclaimed the God of Israel and it stood as a beacon of hope of the holy God, the one that brings salvation, the one that brings his people and gathers them and protects them. And for this reason, I find it quite interesting that the level of opposition is now in a a kind of main hub of Jerusalem, that it's the Jerusalem leaders that are against Jesus, that it's the Pharisees and scribes that come from Jerusalem, the place that proclaimed the Most High God, is now that opposition, that opposition party, that that group of people that are against Jesus, the Son of God, whom they should have known was the Messiah, the living Son of God. The Pharisees, who were rule keepers and, and scholars and who knew the law, were opposed to Jesus at every moment of his ministry. The scribes, who are ultimately a legal group who could write legal documents, found themselves opposed to Jesus for what they felt was a continued lack of regard for the law. It's ironic that that these two groups of people that know the law inside out, know scripture, now reject, argue and oppose the very Messiah the Old Testament prophesied about. It's incredible to see how a group of people have prepared centuries for these moments and yet are completely blinded by their own arrogance and ignorance to the fact that the Messiah now stands right in front of them. Verse 2. They saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they came for, uh, and when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as washing cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of elders, but eat with defiled hands? 
Uh, back in chapters 3 and 4, the leader's issue with Jesus is that he worked on the Sabbath. He healed people on the Sabbath and they picked some grain and ate grain on the Sabbath. Now their issue seems to be with the perceived ceremonial impurity of the disciples of Jesus. In simple terms, the disciples weren't keeping the rules. It's really interesting here actually to note that Mark actually defines what those rules are, which means he's probably writing to a Gentile, a non-Jew reader, because the Jewish people would already know what the rules are. And so Mark is writing to those who wouldn't necessarily understand the rules that the Jews would have to do a ceremonial washing of their hands before they ate. Uh, this meant taking a small amount of water and washing from the fingertips in the palm of your hand and the back of your hand all the way up to your wrist before you could eat anything. The washing was especially needed after being at the marketplace for the Jews were to live and behave differently from the Gentiles and so ceremonially washed away anything that they might have touched before they came to eat. That is that the people of God were standing apart and honouring God with their lives through this tradition, through this ceremonial washing. And clearly what Mark points out is that this apply not just to the hand washing, but also to washing items touched, especially the items that were needed at mealtimes. In the disciples not partaking in this washing, they undermined the tradition of the elders meaning they were essentially ignoring the leaders and how they had interpreted God and his law and how they had implemented it for the people. The issue here wasn't necessarily that they were breaking God's law, rather it seemed they were pro uh, breaking the tradition of the religious leaders. And so the religious leaders challenged Jesus and his disciples to give an answer as to why they are ignoring the tradition of ceremonial washing and therefore coming to eating, coming out of the marketplace as impure because they have ignored what all the Jews do. Consider the response of Jesus in verse 6. And he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honour me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the, the tradition of men. Jesus, rather than going on the defensive, which we often see him do, kind of retreating and kind of discussing or giving a parable, he goes immediately on to the offensive. He quotes directly from the Septuagint, which was the Greek Old Testament. And on the face of it, what he's saying is the Pharisees, the scribes, the Jews honoured God with their lips. They declared God as the most holy God and they declared that they had dedicated their lives to him. Yet in their hearts, they had little care or regard for the ways of the Lord. They were not in fellowship with God. Their hearts were in fact far away from God. Essentially, they were two-faced hypocrites, saying that God was at the centre of all they did, but in reality, their hearts betrayed them as they taught traditions and opinions of doctrine to live by, and they elevated that to the level of the divine. They raised human thinking to the same level as the divine laws of God. Worse still, with raising these opinions, they then ignore the commandments of God and follow the tradition of man. And, and I, I want to just pause here and say that sadly the trading of God's word for an opinion-based faith still happens today. For a moment, just consider some commandments of God or elements of scripture that we have seen traded for tradition of men in the church. God created man and woman. He created two genders, clearly stated in Genesis 1 and 2. Yet now in our society, we have a, a fluidity of genders. And the church in fear of attack softens and goes to accept this fluidity of genders, erring from Scripture. God defines marriage in Genesis 1 and 2, Ephesians 5, as between a man and woman, declaring that homosexuality is a sin. Yet across many churches, there is a rising tide of acceptance of same-sex marriage, erring from Scripture. Take a simpler issue, the issue of grumbling. Scripture is clear, do all things without grumbling. The malcontent and the grumblers are not of God. That's what we've learned in our Philippians part 5. 
But what is the church full of? The church is full of Christians who are grumblers and Christians who are malcontent. Again, erring from scripture. I could go on and on and on with examples of how we have committed outwardly to God, yet inwardly accepted sinful behaviours. You see, committing outwardly to God and declaring him as Lord is, in fact, rather easy, isn't it? You just have to say that you love Jesus and, and you head to church. Maybe you go online. Maybe you're really holy and you watch all of the devotions online. Yet true commitment to God is not outwardly. It's not what is expressed outwardly. It's what is inside. It is what is internal. To commit your heart, your soul, your mind, your life to Jesus. To see scriptures as the very words of God, holding all authority to define what is right and to define what is wrong. Henry Blackaby, an evangelist, states, If you know that God loves you, you should never question a directive from him. It will always be right and best. When he gives you a directive, you're not to observe it, discuss it or debate it. You are to obey it. We worship God in vain if we trade the truth for a sham. Romans 1.18 is clear of the judgment on those who would twist the word of God to the tradition of man. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. When do we see the wrath of God? When we, the truth is suppressed and it is traded for the tradition of man. And I have said time and time and time again that if the Bible says it's wrong, then it is wrong. If the Bible says it is right, then it is right. What the Bible says we should do, we will do. What the Bible says we shouldn't do, we won't do. For it is upon the authority of Scripture that we stand, not the opinion or tradition of man. And I know I'm, I'm spending time labouring this point, but Jesus is clear, Mark 7, as he responds to the Pharisees, that their twisted uh, traditions, their departure from God's word is a sham, and it's simply showing that they are two-faced hypocrites. And it's a sharp warning to any believer in Christ, especially those who are already erring from scripture and arguing for a more palatable society-driven gospel. It is not remotely biblical to say that you are a believer and then in your heart denounce scripture by elevating human thinking to the same level. We stand on sola scriptura, on scripture alone, and anything else, any deviation, any attempt to err from it is not biblical, is sinful, not of God, and is from the devil. And so Jesus goes on the offensive to these Pharisees and points out that they are leading people astray with the tradition of man rather than bringing them to God with the scripture, the words of God. Let's see what Jesus continues to say in verse 9. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honour your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you have gained from me is Corbin, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and many such things you do. Do you see in verse 9, to establish the way of man, the way of society, the changing of scripture to accept sinful behaviours can only happen when we first reject the commandment of God. This is where we begin when we err from scripture. We don't get to accepting sin until we first reject the commandment of God. That's what comes first. What comes first is not the acceptance of sin, but the rejection of God's commandment. So as we err from scripture, what we're doing is we're rejecting God. We're walking away from God. Our hearts are far away from God. And then that leads us into sinful behaviours. And so what the Pharisees have done here is they have first rejected the commandment of God. In their hearts, they have not hold firm to God and his word. And so they have led, been led to a man-made, opinion-based, twisted nature of scripture life. 
Titus 1.6, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Do you see this, that they profess to know God, but by their actions, by their rejection of God's word, they are detestable and disobedient. I want to be very clear here. God will not be mocked. His word must stand as the final authority over a believer's heart. And so to err from it is to walk away from God. And as what Titus says, what Jesus says is that is a detestable thing. And Jesus goes on, though, to show how the religious leaders were doing this. He uses an example, although in verse 13, he clearly points out that there are several examples that he could choose from. The fifth commandment God gave Moses was to honour your father and mother. Not just obey, but honour. We're to care for our parents, learn from them, live as wise by their teaching and to show love and care toward them. Further to this, we're not to curse our father or mother because if we do curse them, then the outcome for us would be death by the judgment of God. These were the commands of God. These are the commands that had been taught through generations and today, still to this day, are taught in church and in families. Yet the religious leaders stated that if a child declared their life as Corbin, then they could essentially ignore the command of God. Now, Corbin is an Aramaic word uh, that, that is defined as an offering to God. So a child could declare their life as Corbin, an offering to God, leading them to little time to honouring from their parents and therefore a free pass and ignoring the commands of God. The idea being is that if they declare Corbin, they go and serve the Lord and forget to serve and honour their parents. But this was a free pass because Corbin was a higher thing, a more important thing. See, they honour God with their lips, with their words, but in their heart, they use it as an excuse to get out of scripture, to ignore scripture. In the end, with human thinking raised to this level as a, a divine command, Corbin, the word of God is suppressed, leading straight to disobedience. And that's shown in Ephesians 5, 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Corbin was an empty word of the time because so many were just simply using it to disobey God, to err from scripture, to go away from scripture, to ignore scripture. And therefore, it was a man-made, brought man-made thought, brought to the level of divine and therefore led people astray. And you see, the religious leaders were always finding ways to argue that God's word doesn't apply. And we still see that today. I can't tell you how many times I have heard Christians say that a verse no longer applies because it was written in a different time, or it's an old verse, or it was specific for that time but not our time, or it no longer applies because we live in the 21st century and things have moved onwards. As an example, over the last couple of weeks, I've been talking with somebody about church leadership, what eldership looks like, what deacons look like, what does it mean to be a pastor? And one of the things that we came out of this conversation noticing is that as we look across the churches, there has been a distinct movement away from eldership. That actually in a lot of churches, especially Baptist churches, we were not seeing a commonality of eldership across churches. In fact, a vast majority of the Baptist churches that we were linked with do not have elders. Why? Well, at the root of the matter, in 1 Timothy 3, we're told that elders have two specific things that are different from deacons. First of all, they have to have the ability to teach, to teach the word of God. Secondly, in 1 Timothy 3, the eldership role is defined as male. And many churches don't like the fact that it defines it as male by a complementarian command and therefore ditch the idea of eldership. They don't like the idea that elders are to teach and that deacons are to serve in other practical yet still spiritual ways and so ditch eldership. Essentially the, the response comes, well, we don't really like this, so we don't really need to have an eldership and if we don't have an eldership then that will deal with the problem. 
we lift our human thinking to the same level as divine commands and therefore we make God's word void, finding ourselves erring from the authority of scripture. And just in that example of eldership, what we've done is we've elevated our thought of leadership teams. We've elevated our thought of business practices. We've elevated our thought of what society tells us. And therefore, we are seeing a reduction in eldership across churches. Yet God's word is clear that churches are to have eldership oversight and that Paul was driven in his missionary journeys to appoint elders over churches. And I'm sure you're probably sitting here thinking, he is going off on one today. He is just picking at things and things are erring here and things are getting uncomfortable. But I want to be very clear, I'm not overplaying this. I'm trying to show you that at any time that we err from scripture, as the religious leaders did, then we walk further and further and further away from Jesus. And I don't want this for us. I don't want us to walk away from Jesus. I want us to draw close to Jesus. For as Blaise Pascal stated, not only do we not know God except through Jesus Christ, we don't, do not even know ourselves except through Jesus Christ. So if we go further away from Jesus, not only will we not know God, we won't know ourselves and we'll be utterly lost. And so as we err from scripture, we lead to being lost. And so I want to call us back to scripture, back to standing on the authority of God's word, what it says we do, what it says we shouldn't do, we don't do, what it says is right is right, what it says is wrong is wrong. If we stand on that, then we draw close to Jesus, we know God, and we know ourselves as a true child in faith, a child of God, co-heir to the throne of the heavenly realms and part of the family of God. But we lose that when we err from scripture Go back to our passage and from verse 14. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. Jesus turns his attention away from the leaders and onto what I imagine is a growing crowd of listeners. And he often does this. He takes a question, he responds, but then he turns to all those who are listening, to that crowd, to those who are beginning to follow Jesus. Now remember, the leaders are frustrated because the disciples hadn't done their elevated human thinking tradition of ceremonial washing. As an aside, I just want to be very clear here. It's important to wash your hands before meals, especially in this time. However, the issue here is not about having clean hands so when you come to eat, you won't infect yourself with some form of bug. It's about ceremonial cleaning. It's about a, a show, a, an example, a, a ceremonial cleanliness when you come before God. And what they are stating as leaders is if you don't do this ceremonial cleaning, then you are defiled, you're showing you're against God and that you should be removed from the people of God until you are pure once again. But what Jesus says here is what comes out of an individual is an expression of what they already are. What he's saying is the evidence of, of your heart, the evidence of who you are, the evidence of defilement within you comes out with evidence and examples and behaviours. And to get a better understanding of this, we really need to head into verse 17. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. I just want to pause there. Isn't it interesting? The disciples were willing to ask Jesus for understanding. That is an example to us. When we don't understand something, it's not blogs, it's not articles, it's not the leading thinkers of our time. It is Jesus that we go to for the answer. Uh, consider verse 18 and he said to them then are you also without understanding do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled thus he declared all foods clean the disciples dig that little bit deeper. They want to get better understanding. They want to understand what Jesus is talking about here, about internal defilement, not from an external uh, uh, um, impurity, from not ceremonial washing, but something uh, that is coming from out, uh, out of them. So they ask the question, what does this mean? And ultimately it boils down to how you define a person, by what they put in, for example, food, or by what comes out, for example, the issue of hypocrisy in the religious leaders. People are not defined by ceremonial laws. 
Rather, they are defined by their heart and their heart's desires. Remember, ceremonial laws will be brought to an end in the death of Jesus because we are cleansed and forgiven as we place our faith in Jesus. Social regulations will end because there will not be definition between Jew and Gentile, Jew and non-Jew, but the church will be established and it will be believer and non-believer, those who have placed faith in Jesus and those who have rejected Jesus. And the moral law will receive a, a deeper meaning as it's placed under the light of Jesus and so we'll understand how to apply God God's law through the grace of Jesus in our lives and as we walk for Jesus. So the ritual keeping, this tradition placed before man, is not what defines us. Rather, it's what our heart does. It's what our heart uh, uh, wants, what our heart desires, and therefore what comes from the heart, whether we accept Jesus in our behaviour or we're rejecting Jesus in our behaviour. So how do we know, specifically in a church context, whether someone is defiled, meaning they have rejected Jesus and the authority of Scripture, or are pure, meaning they have accepted Jesus and stand on Scripture? Because this is ultimately what it boils down to. The religious leaders wanted to know who was ceremonial clean and ceremonially unclean. But what Jesus is saying is, is about the heart, is whether they have accepted Jesus or have rejected Jesus. So it's still the same question, but the premise is different. The premise is now about our heart, not about our outward expression, not what about if our hands are clean or we're ceremonially clean. And we get the answer in verse 20 onwards. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and they defile a person. And so what Jesus comes out with is a, a, almost a new way of thinking in this time that our behaviours, what comes out of a person, the evidence that comes from the heart out of a person is what defiles them. It shows what their heart is like. And Jesus gives a few ways for us to see this. Evil thoughts, often centred around self and a self-centred way of life. Sexual immorality, ranging from marital unfaithfulness to homosexuality to the use of pornography. Theft, the taking of another person's belongings. Murder, the taking of human life. And, and really importantly today, because this has just been going through uh, commons and MPs, that murder also applies to unborn humans in respect of abortion. Coveting, the desire for another person's possessions or circumstance. Wickedness, wickedness the hope of someone else's demise, that they would be worse off for your gain. Deceit, purposely leading people astray, saying one thing but doing another. Sensuality, the, the temptation of sexual immorality. Envy, being jealous of one another. Slander, the speaking of false accusations against one another. Pride, thinking you are better or that you know better. Foolishness, giving little regard to the wisdom of God. All of these signs are outward expressions of what is within the heart and therefore that is what defiles us. We see similar lists in Ephesians and in Galatians. But before moving on to a closing application of what this actually means for us, let me just say this. Let's give a, a, a brief recap here. The disciples haven't partaken in the tradition of washing hands. They are ceremonially unclean and the religious leaders are annoyed. Jesus responds by going on the offensive by pointing out that they are hypocrites, that they have raised the tradition of man to the level of God. They've elevated human thinking to divine law. And Jesus was asked the question, why has he allowed this? Jesus responds with a question of what it does it mean to be defiled? Does it mean to be defiled because you haven't washed your hands or does it mean to be defiled in some other way? His response is that your heart makes you a sinner, not whether your hands are clean or not. How you behave, how you think, how you speak shows your heart. By your actions you will know them, by their fruits you will know them. Lovers of Jesus will be known by their humble service to the Lord and faithfulness to his word and lovers of self will be known by their long list of visible sins that are on display. 
It's a simple explanation, but a powerful explanation. If you behave in an ungodly way, then your heart is ungodly. If you behave in a godly manner, then your heart is godly. What comes out is the expression of defilement or of purity. And with that understanding that Jesus has placed before his disciples, the crowd and the religious leaders, he now places that before us for us to apply it to our own lives. So how do we apply this interaction and, and then specifically the teaching of Jesus to our own lives? And to help us, I'm gonna split this into two ways. The first way and the first explanation is for the non-Christian. You cannot earn your way to salvation. You cannot do a tick list and get approval from God. You can try, you can try to be a good person, you can try to do right things, you might even do a daily good deed, but what comes out of you is ultimately going to betray your heart. Trying is not going to solve the sinful nature and the wickedness of your heart. John 14, six says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The heart of the problem is the problem with the heart. You cannot earn the reward of heaven or live in peace with God without first dealing with the problem of the heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Your heart is wicked and no amount of good actions can make it right again. No amount of good actions can hide the wickedness of the heart. But praise God because he has given us the gift of his son Jesus. Because Jesus came to die for you and me. For he knew we would never be able to make things right between us, between me and between God. So he in perfect righteousness took our sin, past, present and future and nailed it to the cross. So that in faith in Jesus we would have our hearts well again. He would provide us eternal salvation and pave a way to a relationship with God. We would go from a wicked person to a child of God, from a heart that betrays us to a renewed heart in Jesus. And that is the wonderful gift of the gospel, that although our heart is broken and we are attempting to fix it, Jesus can make us whole again and our attempts can be left to the side. No ritual, no tradition, no amount of perceived good works can restore a broken heart. Only Jesus can. So right now, I want to encourage you to stop trying and start looking. To stop trying to get things right and instead look to Jesus. Don't end up like the religious leaders, arrogant, far away from God, thinking some form of cleaning, good deed, good working is going to somehow save you. But be like the Jesus, be like the disciples and ask God for understanding to seek Jesus in your life, to have your heart that is broken, renewed in Jesus, to be given the gift of salvation and the eternal home in the heavenly realms as a co-heir to Christ. Because in coming to Jesus, he is the way to the Father. He is the truth that will help you get to the Father. And he is the life that he provides you once you accept him and place your faith in him. Don't be like the religious leaders. Don't twist God's word. Go to Jesus because he can renew your life. The second aspect I want to apply this passage in is for the Christian. I want to say this. Your actions betray you. You say that you have joy in Jesus, yet you respond with anger and frustration and grumbling. You say that you have the love of the truth of God, yet you pervert it and water it down challenged by the word to no longer stand on the authority of scripture. You say that God is the Lord of your life, yet your actions are showing that you live your life for yourself. Ultimately, you have the same problem. You have, uh, the heart of your problem is the problem with your heart. Yes, you have received salvation in Jesus. Praise God that our heart is fixed. But you so often hark back to the day where your heart was broken. You err from scripture. You disobey God. And because of that, your actions show that you haven't taken the joy of Jesus, the new life of Jesus to heart and living for him. We wouldn't have a tenth of the problems we find in church if we approached every situation with the heart of Jesus. 
Now the root of every single issue is the lack of Jesus-centeredness. And we must pray that the Holy Spirit fills us up with Jesus, fills us up with the authority of Scripture, fills us up with the Word of God, so that what comes out is nothing but Jesus. I want to be very clear today, and we've touched on some, some raw things within the church today. But what comes out of a person shows their heart. There's an individual in church that is known for their encouragement. They're, they're, they're often talked about as the great encourager. That is because their heart has the joy of Jesus. And when you sit with this person, they just talk about Jesus. They just love Jesus. They are quite literally all for Jesus. That is all they want to talk about, all they want to think about, and all that they want to do. Jesus. But I've also sat with people in church who don't talk about Jesus and are known as grumblers, known as angry people, known as people who frankly you just don't want to talk to because it just brings you down. They are discouragers. By their action we know them. What comes out defiles them. They show that their heart isn't full of the joy of Jesus. They show that the, the Spirit hasn't worked and changed their hearts so that they live for Jesus in all that they do. And so what we're talking about today is ultimately this, the choice to be all for Jesus and therefore all our actions, all of our thoughts, all of our speech is all for Jesus or to be for self and therefore all of our actions, all of our thoughts and all of our speech is for self. I want to close by reading from Galatians 5 because I believe Galatians 5 show us the life of a wicked heart and then the life of a pure heart in Jesus. And my prayer is that you would uh, choose to be the latter, the, the heart for Jesus rather than the heart for self. And so rather than taking uh, my human thinking and raising it to divine level, let us take God's word and pour it on our lives as we close today. Ephesians chapter 5 and from verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For they are opposed to each other to keep you from doing things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies and things like these. I warn you as I have warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we pray that we would uh, be like the disciples and that we would ask you for understanding so that we can better live our lives for you. Father, take our wicked hearts and make them pure again. Take our wicked hearts and change them, mould them so that the joy of Jesus is in our hearts and what comes out of us doesn't defile us, but is evidence of our love for you. Father, for those who have uh, heard the list of the wickedness, who have heard the, the list of sins, who have heard the things that come out of a wicked heart and, and feel that they are those people, Father, we pray that right now that you would draw close to them, that you would encourage them with your gospel truth, that you would transform their lives and that our church would declare, not just with our lips, but with our actions and with our thoughts, that we are all for Jesus, that we love him, that we praise him, that we worship him, and that your word has ultimate authority over all all aspects of our lives, of our families' lives, and of our church life. And so, Father, we pray this, praying that we glorify our Heavenly Father, praying in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.